Welcome to the Honest Designers Show, your transparent look into life as a modern designer. My name's Tom Ross, and I'm the founder at designcuts.com. And this week, I'm joined by my fellow Brit and hand lettering expert, Ian Barnard, the incredibly charming American retro design expert, Dustin Lee, and the always talented South African illustrator, Lisa Glanz. In today's episode, we talk about one of the best ways to increase your earnings by an order of magnitude. How can you go from being perceived as a disposable junior designer to someone who can command serious value within their industry? So without further ado, let's get into the show. Dude, I tried to make you laugh through that whole thing. I know, seriously. Like three different things. It's so impossible. He's so focused. He's I am. So focused. I'm laser focused. You yeah, you're not going to shake me like that, buddy. I've got for yeah. anyone who um, who is Nerves watching the YouTube version. Literally, I've got Dustin pulling ridiculous faces at me while I read the intro to this show every time. But he will not throw me. I'm a consummate oh. professional. My self esteem drops every time I do it. I'm just like, I am a unfunny loser Aww. that thinks he can make Tom laugh, but Tom actually like. Tom, throw him a bone next time. Throw me a bone, Give buddy. him a little giggle. He just wants me to fumble and stumble. Little giggle on your little bone and milk. No more. Oh, um, uh, okay, so I I feel like this episode is going to be quite a big one uh, for people in terms of the value they get because we're talking all about how they can position themselves to be more valuable. And this is, um, in truth, something I'm pretty sure I just saw in Chris Doe's content, but I thought it would be a, a good topic to kind of elaborate on and discuss in a group setting. So what they talk about quite often, and it's completely true, and it's how I've found my own freelance career to be. When we start early on, we tend to be quite broad. Um, and this is not a niching discussion, by the way, we covered that recently, but we tend to be quite broad. But more than that, we tend to offer stuff that does not have that much associated value. So it might be like, I'm going to do that leaflet or flyer design for you or I'm going to do that business card design for you, or that kind of work. Obviously, that has quite a low ceiling. But as you move up, you can get into stuff like a comprehensive brand reframing or providing brand strategy services. And that's one example. But you can see how there's kind of a ladder and there's a few steps to get there. You don't go from like a junior, I'll do your business cards, mate, to like, offering a comprehensive brand package. Um, and this is partly on the back of, of recently, my business partner and creative director, Matt, he led a, a live presentation at Design Cuts where he was showing his client documentation. And it was the real documentation his agency used. And they had like tiered project models. So it was like, if you just want this kind of basic package, it's obviously much cheaper. And then as it went up, it got incrementally more expensive. Mm. And he used to charge like a lot for, for this kind of stuff. And funny enough, the stuff at the top, the most expensive stuff was all of the kind of brand strategy and reframing and where you take the time to really understand your client and their market. And you're not literally a, a pixel pusher being like, here's a nice looking flyer without any real wider context about what the objectives are of that flyer, et cetera, et cetera. What are your guys' thoughts in terms of this topic? Yeah, I think um, you've worked so hard to get that client in your door. So you need to find ways to leverage it as much as possible. Um, it's kind of like squeezing every last little blood out of the stone, essentially. Um, even if you're a junior designer, you can you can still try and think of ways to either um, extend or expand, should I say, the job offering um, that they initially have asked you for um and but that's why it's important for you to be the driver in this whole case like you can't expect them to read your mind or um ask you for oh by the way do you do this mm -hmm. you you need to be the one driving that um as i said even if you are a junior designer so you've worked really hard to get the client in the door so why not while they're there say well seeing as you're here you know i can kind of do this and this and this for you and i think um it makes sense it to already use the assets that you had, you know, you have. Um, so yeah, it'd be silly to kind of let that go because there, there's someone in front of you that you can sell it to. 
Do you think as well, um, perhaps don't even offer the lower tier stuff and leave that for the more junior? So it's like if people come to you in the first place, it's because they want yeah. the full package kind of thing. Yes. To be honest, I very quickly did that, Tom. I, I got rid of the fact that I only do this, mm -hmm. you know, like I only do logo design. I very soon said to them, like, I don't only offer that. My, uh, you know, if you want to come to me, I'm kind of like the whole package kind of thing. Yeah. Because it, it was way... <laughs> <laughs> Dustin it was way more worth my while because you're going to that effort of the initial interview um you know you're putting all the groundwork of asking those questions etc cetera, etc cetera. so while you're doing all of that you're really gathering information that you can apply to the extended package um so you, you you're kind of like done half the work anyway mm -hmm. if you're just going to do the logo you're wasting that extra information that you could have used on another project for that yeah and there's a big difference right let's take the logo example um, if I was the designer and you're the client, Lisa, and you came to me and you're like, I need a logo. Um, there's a big difference between you being like, give me a logo with a blue tick in it. And I'm like, <laughs> there you go. Um, versus like, give me the best logo that's going to benefit my business and you're the expert. And then yeah. I'm like, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to research all of your competitors and make sure it differentiates against them. We're going to assess like how your business is currently perceived by the market and by your existing customer base. And, and then we're going to work out mm. how to reframe it. And we're going to have very specific um, aims with the reframe and what we want to achieve and, and the shift in, in perceived value. And that potentially is going to have an impact on sales and revenue and customer retention and the overall perception of your brand and company like all of that's real things but that's all very very chargeable and it should be chargeable because you're Definitely. you're going to massively undervalue and undermine yourself if you're going to do all that work and say oh yeah but it's um it's a hundred dollars just for that logo yeah um, and i think uh, using that information like um I guess what I'm trying to say is like you, you can assess up front like what kind of clients is this? Is, a, is this a high end client that's got a bit of budget um, or is this the the small guy who wants to spend fifty dollars on a logo? You know, it's you need to assess that and and personally, I didn't take the the fifty dollar jobs because of the kind of person I am. I would have applied, you know, the high end brain capacity if that makes sense <laughs> yeah. um I, I wouldn't have been able to just churn out something quickly it's just not in my nature i i don't i don't know i, I don't know how to do that so um that sounds weird but you know what i'm trying to get at yep. um like I, I would i would apply the full-on package and then i would suffer because i'd be applying so much energy so why not charge for that you know um yeah i think that um Anything that you want to sell, whether you want to do some, you know, just biz like business cards or flyers or, or or whole branding systems, whatever it is, I think all of it can be made very profitable, but you have to start with the end in mind. So you have to think, how much am I trying to make and what's the pathway to getting there? Um, like, so for example, there's a guy named, you know, I, I know named Joe Cav Cavazos, I believe is his name. He does freelance work, a lot of stuff for churches, um, but he also realized that there was some that couldn't afford the social media package that he would custom design. So he made something, um, a site where I think it was called Sunday, Sunday social TV or something like that. And mm -hmm. people could go there and they could get from a huge library of pre-made church based social stuff. That way, when those people came, he's like, okay, so for these other tier of people that I can't, that can't afford me, they can get this and it's on a subscription basis. And it's just like $9 a month for the basic one, but $9 over the course of five years adds up to a lot of money. Uh, mm. So I guess my whole point is if you reverse engineer things and think, where can upsells come in? Where can cross sells come in? Where can I get them into some sort of situation where they will have to come back to me on a regular basis? If you think things out in that way, as opposed to just getting on a call and improvising like jazz mm -hmm. to try to figure out how you're going to work with a customer, yeah. then you can create systems where more money can be made and more value can be delivered. I'm, so I'm going to throw you a little the e in, um, Ian Bernard um, Kerpel here, okay? Because <laughs> Ian quite rightly loves the specifics. And like, tell me exactly how that plays out. And as you're saying all this stuff, I get it. 
and I agree with that. But I'm thinking of, I hope he doesn't mind me naming him. I'm thinking of Dave, one of my community members. He's a UK designer. He's just getting started. He's very recently got like his first paying client. He's going out pitching and, and not quite landing some of the pitches. And as we know, that's completely normal. This stuff mm-hmm. sounds like cuckoo land. You know, when I put myself in Dave's shoes, like you're upselling and cross-selling and all of this, that sounds super scary and intimidating and, and out of reach. Like, like I'm not even in that arena yet. So for someone like Dave who's a bit earlier, how can they benefit from trying to shift up the ladder in order of magnitude, do you think? And, sh- well, and should I, I suppose it, like with, with what Dustin said, you could have a response to, oh, we can't afford that. So if they can't afford it, then give them another option rather than just saying, okay. No, and then, yeah. So have options for, but, you know, but, keep... Um, so, sorry, yeah, like I, I completely agree. But for someone who's a bit more junior and they're... they're it's not that they're constantly um, getting clients where they could even downsell them in that way. It's more they're in that phase of like, I just want to kind of take what I can get and, and you know, get the ball rolling here. Do you think they mm. should be worrying about trying to do different orders of magnitude or do you think they have to be head down and pay their dues and just kind of do the crappy work to start with? I think of it kind of like, imagine if you're a guitar player. If you're a guitar player and you don't know your major scale, you don't you don't know how chords in the key of C, go what the chords are, and then you want to go play with a band or you want to go play in front of people, um, you have to know some sort of fun- fundamentals, even if that's just, you know, your C, F, and G, right? Your one, four, five of a, a chord progression on guitar. And I think of the same thing with, um, and you just can't expect to somehow extract some magic of getting all these gigs or whatnot, unless you're going to start understanding that. I mean, cross cells and upsells can be explained in one sentence. It's not rocket science. And even if they're not at a point where they can charge that, at least understanding these, these components and being able to understand yeah. how they might interlock how you might be able to improvise that to bring the guitar thing back in to mm-hmm. improvise those things together is going to be really fundamental to making money. If you, if you don't, you're working at a tremendous disadvantage and there's not really a way around it. I mean, you have to at least understand it and then be able to improvise around that. It's I, to me, it feels very much like the guitar analogy. I mean, if, if you don't understand a scale or a chord progression, how on earth yeah. are you going to try to ask people if you can go play at the yeah. restaurant on this Friday night? It's almost like it. I mean, I, I re, if I recall my early days of of being self employed, it's it's like the the feet. If you separate the body, the top half of the body and the mind and the arms are like thinking of of all those things that Dustin mentioned of scaling. Um, how can you cross sell? How can you you know all those kind of stuff for your future? The bottom is kind of like treading water at the beginning stages because you're just trying to like stay afloat. Um, so you're doing you 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 probably will be taking on jobs that you don't eventually would want to be doing, but you need to pay the bills. So the bottom half is still doing all those kind of things, but the top half is still is thinking it's more about aspirational. the future and yeah, exactly. So that when that job does come in your door. Uh, you're ready for it. You, you've yeah. already set out in your mind whether you've you've just thought about it, whether it's on paper, whether it's whatever. You've you've thought about it and you're ready to actually sell that to that client that is of that caliber, because you probably are only going to get your small guy in the beginning coming to you um, until you reach that point. You you must be ready for it yeah. for sure. I I wish I had the context and knowledge that I slash we have now when uh i was in the later stages of my freelance career because i never had like dizzying heights but i really started to see some traction and being able to charge some more decent amounts and then i just kind of pivoted and stopped freelancing and went and did the whole um business thing but looking back i legitimately think that if i took all the knowledge i've got now and dumped it into my younger brain i probably could have charged maybe not 10 times more, but like at least five times more than I was and yeah. actually gotten away with it. Like understanding things mm. like value adding, value added pricing, um, upsells and cross sells, like actually doing the due diligence of, um, you know, selling myself in terms of that wider service of overall brand strategy and conversion specialist rather than what I was good at is like, I'm going to bring you this value and like, I'm going to do a really good job and make it a no-brainer for you. What I should have done more is actually like 
well, I'm going to break that down. And part of that includes this work and this work and this work and this work. And you're going to make your money back in this many months. And, you know, just breaking it down and, and pushing a bit more. But because I was mm. younger, I was more just like, oh, this is more money than I'm used to freelancing. And I, aren't I doing well? But like um, it, it could have been a different order of magnitude. And so I, I hear what you guys are saying about like paying your dues in the early days. But I think this whole debate is actually most useful for a lot of the listeners out there who do have steady work, but just want to earn more money. Mm. This is where you just drop this on. And it's like it puts the whole thing on steroids if it's ex executed correctly. Yeah, I was going to, I was curious what you thought about that, Tom, because I think you're right. Like I was just talking to someone the other day about being in school. I was like, man, if I had the knowledge of how little had to be done to be exceptional in high school, I think I would have tried harder. <laughs> I just didn't understand how little it actually took to stand out. Um, but as, as so I'm true. saying that as a 38 year old man now, when I was that age, it felt like this insurmountable thing. But mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think, Tom, about the idea of yeah, because you're right. You can read about cross sells and upsells and how, you know, lifetime value of a customer, all these things. And they're not complicated concepts. But again, to go back to that guitar thing, like I remember when I first went out and played a couple of shows, I didn't get invited back. I mean, I, I just had to suck. I played too loud and customers <laughs> would leave early and then they didn't get to sell them as many drinks or food. It just was the price you had to pay. You know, there was no way around it. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. do you feel that I hate to say it's called paying your dues, although like that's a fair name for it. Like, do you feel like you do have to go through that stage or do you feel like there's a way to eliminate having to go through that stage? I think you need to go through that phase. I really do. And I think that with everything. So even putting content out on social media, another one in my community, this young guy called Fred, he recently put his first Instagram post out. There's no point talking to him about like how to do super advanced community building stuff before he gets his first post out and probably before yeah. he gets his hundred post out the same way if you were a personal trainer and your client was massively obese you're not going to start like looking at like hyper specific you know areas of form or like super advanced exercises it's like okay we're just going to reduce your calories a bit and get you moving a bit, a bit more and we're going to start there yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think it's valuable. Um, I think those those days of paying your dues, if you want to call it that, I think it's super important from a learning mm -hmm. perspective. It's great fodder for podcast episodes as well. There is that too. <laughs> <laughs> Just think of that in the future, <laughs> what you can teach it's, people. <laughs> it's also a, a blessing because imagine if it didn't exist. I mean, if if there were no dues to be paid and you could just walk out and start making money, then there wouldn't be any barrier and mm. the competition would be insane. I mean, the fact that there's a certain amount of work that has to be done in failure and embarrassment that has to occur before you could succeed in any way means that a lot of people give up and walk away and it filters people out, thus making, to mm -hmm. me it seems, the market more bearable or able to sustain people. You know yeah, imagine if imagine if every single freelance designer right now updated their website and Instagram to say, I offer comprehensive brand strategy services. <laughs> um, it would just be a complete <laughs> sham because they wouldn't have the skills and, and experience to back that up. And so, yeah, like f f my my thinking right now is if you're like super early days, you need to pay your dues because there's no shortcuts. If, if you yeah. are established to the point you are bringing in steady income, I would start flirting with some of the ideas here. Um, because even, yeah. even if you're like, you know, st struggling to make ends meet, but you at least have a steady, you know, repeatable source of income from a pool of clients or whatever. Um, I really think like dropping something like this on top of it and thinking, how do I move up that ladder to that next order of magnitude? is highly effective so it's like okay currently i am just churning out flyer designs and i'm working every hour but i'm going to start shifting my services and, and being able to upsell this wider yeah. kind of more holistic service and and you know simple um task of actually auditing i know we've spoken about auditing before um auditing what you spend your time on and not charging for it that i think people make that uh, mistake hugely because that is, they're kind of like offering that second tier or third tier or fourth tier of work quality 
and they're not charging for it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good thing to, even though you are only offering a flyer at this point, but what if you've actually advised the client to rather go this route and have you thought about that route instead and maybe we should include this? You, you are actually giving them a strategy, like a business strategy um, as well with, with the, the design, but you're not charging for it and it's insane. So sometimes it's just a case of, okay, hang on, I might be actually giving that added service, but I'm actually just not charging for it. So maybe I should just, you know, I, start putting it in my bills. So I recently, um, in fact, at Birmingham Design Festival within, I attended Christo's pricing workshop and he, oh, yeah? he showed real project breakdowns from previous clients. And some of it was, um, and he almost admitted that it was quite like a filler where it's like you just slap on an extra few thousand and call it like production costs. And then you put in a, another cost here and have that as like research phase. And it, so essentially the work is the same, but you're able just to bolt yeah. on elements of pricing and present that yeah. as something that's viable for the client. And I could feel like a bit of a um, restlessness in the room where a lot of particularly the more junior people got quite uncomfortable and were like, isn't that unethical and, and that kind of thing. But mm. it, it's mm. not really because it's up to you what you charge. And it physically can't be ripping someone off. Like if you say, here's how much I am and they see enough value in that to pay you that price, it doesn't matter how you skin it. It's the same value exchange. Right. Yeah, and especially if you if you find it difficult to um, I don't know describe or, or or think about your design process. I mean, each artist is different, right? So they they might take I don't know five days to research and two hours to design, and I might take two hours to research and twenty days to design. You know, but you so it's, it would be difficult to really put that into a box, essentially. Um, so that's often why people do what you just said, Tom. They they kind of like slap on these additional fees that is a buffer mm -hmm. to help you like kind of um, the, the just in cases because you're going to be spending so much more time. Anyway. I mean, like when I put on production costs onto my bills to, you know, that was dealing with a printer – that, that's taking into account of like the printer phoning me and saying, hey, we've run out of paper. We're waiting three weeks to get the new load. And then me running around trying to find another printer that, to like, it's like a the contingency, job. I mean, it's, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, the client, sometimes you, the client, you know, is paying a little more than potentially they should. I don't know. But sometimes they're getting a bargain because they don't know what you just did to get their job done. And, and again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think about like, is the client getting a bargain or are they getting ripped off? Like the price is the price. No, I, it, they're either willing yeah. to pay it or they're not. Well, exactly. and it's the same thing the, as the, the as perception yeah. perception of how um, you present an offer. So, you know, different perceptions have different conversion rates or different um, amounts of people that will buy, buy into the idea of consuming or buying your service. Just like when you go to the store, I mean, is... I don't know if you have them there, but if, is Lay's potato chips, are they lying when they say buy two bags of Lay's potato chips and you get the third free, even though they've built the price of the third bag into the two other bags that they charge you for? Is yeah. that a lie yeah. or is that <laughs> just restructuring things in a way that is more attractive to the consumer? Because we certainly don't yeah. look at Lay's and say, what an unethical piece of garbage that they did that. We we understand that mm -hmm. what's happening, yeah. you know? Um, it's reframing something to, exactly. I guess, Great that word. is more digestible for 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 somebody in that that industry. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Reframing. That's a great word. Hmm. Ian, what are you hearing over there, buddy? <laughs> Lots of things. Because uh, <laughs> I've always found pricing really hard, and still do, and that's probably why I <laughs> went away from client work because I inability to do this sort of thing but what i've come to know is a lot of it's to do with how much of of the thing i struggle with is the business side of things with design and how i could have yeah like you say if you transplanted what you know now back into um me back then me younger then um that i could have offered a bit more or refrains you know they just they say oh how much for this and i just give them a price and it'd be nothing around it it'd just be a price with no context mm -hmm. and i suppose 
you know, even if you're not offering all these things, just putting your price in a context uh, and and some wording around it will really help. Um, it, it looks more professional. Buying of you, yeah, it's only to buy into you because otherwise they're just like it's just the price, isn't it? It's like when a builder just says, "Oh, it's just it's going to cost this much." And you're mm. like, "But I want to know what the breakdown of that is." Yeah, you know, why is it going to cost that much? Yeah, exactly. So. It's also. It also helps you, uh, it covers you uh, when the client sort of oversteps the the boundary of the original uh, brief that you guys discussed, you know. So if they start saying, oh, and by the way, can you add that to um, this X, Y, and Z? Oh, and while you're there, can you just like just tweak that? And, yeah. and that yeah. wasn't part of the original thing. And there you are now um, absorbing those extra jobs. You're not charging for them because there's no... <laughs> definitive kind of like boundary you know i just thought of dustin's old client where he just paid him a tiny amount and then had him working for like well, two exactly. years or There's a, that was, you know i know we bring it up a lot but it's it's a perfect example of so many things that 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 we all do wrong when we're young and still learning you know mm. it's yeah well interesting to think about about the whole thing too is um what does the client want so you might uh, you might have a list of things that you're charging them for but then if you talk to the client, they might say, well, I want, you know, a, a branding package that's going to make me stand out from all my competitors. There's so many people that have lawn mowing services, you know, in a, my town. Like, how am I going to stand out? So by understanding things like that, you can then be like, OK, well, the competitor intelligence that we do is going to be two thousand dollars. And you might have done that anyways. But. Mm -hmm. It would be harder to justify it unless you knew the words that they needed to hear yes. connected to the price. The lingo. Right. Yep. If I just said research, they'd say, who cares about research? But if I say yeah. competitor intelligence, we're going to spy on these bastards and we're going to figure out how we can get in and get some leverage on those people and take some, steal some yep. customers from them. Then they'll be like, yeah, you're speaking my language. That sounds like it's worth $2,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and if you've done if you've done the whole pre thinking of what are the different tiers or, or services you can offer or upscale, um, before you've even done it, um, so when a client starts getting a bit iffy and there's and they they're expecting more, like oh, can you add this? Can you do this while you're there? That's when you can say, sure, I can. You start now. We are moving into the next tier of the services that I offer. You know, and it's like it's easier for you to deal with that funny weird situation because. You start going, well, actually, it's a little bit out of what we discussed, but you don't want to piss them off. And then you start bending your own rules. And mm -hmm. But it would be so much easier for you to turn around in a very professional manner and say, of course, I can do that with pleasure. This is my um, pricing for that next tier of work that I offer, services that I offer. You know? I'll tell you the opposite of what we're talking about today, because um, that might be kind of useful to see the, um, the not the parallel literally like the antithesis of what we're describing so um yeah. we've answered questions from people on this show which are like should i pay for the printing costs or should the client um and we've answered other questions where it's like so if i'm like employing a team of freelancers to help complete this project i don't need to charge management fees right for my time managing them and, and uh, yeah all these kinds of things right they seem crazy but they're very commonplace and so hopefully you can mm. see like the disparity between these two models because in the model where you're able to charge a lot more you're saying okay so i'm doing you know your competitor analysis and i am having a production fee and i'm having a management fee for looking after the team that help execute this project for you and there are production costs such as printing and they go in this part of the of the fee and it's just a completely different game that you're playing completely mm -hmm. and you know clients uh, they want to see that they want to see what am i paying for where yeah. is my money and you're actually making them feel a lot better about the fact that they can almost pinpoint where every penny is going whereas if you just give them a flat fee it's yeah they don't know what it feels a bit empty for. yeah it feels yeah I, i'll tell yeah. you what it feels it feels arbitrary it feels mm -hmm. like i've yeah. gone it's like where, I, did, I've gone, where did you lo low, that yeah enough? logo design <laughs> uh, that'll be five grand <laughs> yeah grab that number yeah. Like, right yeah sometimes yeah. designers will tell me well you know i really need to like charge what i'm worth and then i'll be talking about uh, five thousand or ten thousand dollars and then you see what they're doing you're like that's not what you're worth you're worth like three hundred dollars <laughs> yeah 
which I guess is the other important part about this is that you have to be delivering on things. And I think oftentimes people don't have a problem paying for something. I mean, who has a problem? What kind of business has a problem paying with something that has a return on investment? Oh, mm-hmm. Almost no business. It's, it's yeah. when you're just delivering them a bunch of extra useless stuff that, I mean, that's disappointing and you feel kind of burnt and people are yeah. smart. They know yeah. when they've just got a bunch of filler stuff that doesn't do anything. It's true. And they'll never come back. <laughs> they won't, yeah. And really, it's a lot easier to get get a little less up front and more over time, oftentimes. Yeah. I mean, like, when Ian lettered that one guitar for me, he way overcharged me. So I sent all my other guitars to other people to do the lettering on it. It was just I too much. Di- I didn't have a problem with the 10 grand uh, research. <laughs> you got more than my customer lifetime value, so you were good. Man, I still need to yeah, send you, 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 you got the uh, Justin Lee loyal customer fee. <laughs> <laughs> An extra three grand. Did, did you let, quite a you let today a uh, guitar for Dustin, Ian? No, yeah, I was playing. I do. I should uh, send a guitar. I was going to say, I re- I'm, I've said for a while, I'm desperate for that. Hmm. It too. looks like you owe people a lot of guitars, Ian. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, friends and family discount, mate. Let's undermine yeah, the entire guitar. discussion we've had and let's really hammer <laughs> Ian's say. value into the ground. Well, I'll, I'll do a certain tier for you, Tom. Okay. Little you, family tier, which kind. is like 10 times more expensive than everyone else's tier. Oh. <laughs> Spe- speaking of proving your value, like that's like a very easy way to prove your value is just be like, oh, People pay me to letter stuff, including like on guitars. I mean, guitars cost a lot of money. If people are saying, will you please get out a pen and write all over the front of my guitar, <laughs> you must be pretty good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh. So um, have we got any closing thoughts, dear people, with how to, I mean, fi- final quick tips, quick fire tips here on getting that value up. What, what can people do out there? So they can... Words. Make sure you use it, some words <laughs> when explaining. <laughs> That's what we've boiled down this episode to. Use your words, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, context. Yes. Make sure that your your costings come with context. Yep. Context. Okay. I, yeah. I would say make it um, more about the value that your client is going to get from it. So yes, you can charge more for that. Yes, you can itemize it and do some of the stuff we talked about in this episode, but... Um, inherently it needs to get that ROI that Dustin mentioned as a client I need to understand like okay cool I understand the breakdown but the bottom line is I'm only going to give you this money if I think I'm going to get more back in terms of value I would say think backwards so many freelancers that I talk to are like I don't know you know it's feast famine I don't know what's going to happen next month so think backwards think about what seeds am I going to plant in this offer right now that are going to be insurance policies of a certain amount of these people coming back for more work. So Mm. I'm not struggling every month, but just in general, Mm -hmm. start from the end and work your way. I mean, right. Like on anything. Yeah. I mean, if you, if, even if you're new to the game, it's, it's a good idea to have some kind of uh, kind of some kind of idea of where you want your business to go um and you want to start already framing it at least in your mind um of the services you want to offer in the future perfect example is like what tom was talking about when i did that thing i think the guy gave me fifteen hundred dollars to work on to finish his website for him we had no timeline we had we had no (laughs) we had no idea when it was done i ended up working for a year basically like on a salary of fifteen hundred dollars annually, because I did not think <laughs> about the end. <laughs> yep. I thought about getting some money right then when I needed it. Dustin, Very I foolish. employ you for that. Very foolish. <laughs> uh, what a bargain! Uh, yeah, hats off to that guy. <laughs> Tell you that guy got yeah, me a lesson worth a lot more than fifteen hundred dollars, though. I wonder if he's doing it to someone else right now. I'm sure. Yeah, probably. He's just cycling through them. Um, cool, <laughs> guys. I hope this episode was helpful. As always, bye from the four of us. And we will see you this time, bright and early, next week. Bye. Bye. See bye. you later.
Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, you can find full show notes over at honestdesigners.com or find us over on iTunes and now Spotify by searching for The Honest Designers Show. And remember, we're now on social media too if you search for Honest Designers. If today's episode helped you, then it would mean the world to us if you took just a moment to leave us a quick review over on iTunes, as this is one of the best ways for other designers to discover the show. Thanks again for tuning in, and we will see you next week right here on The Honest Designers Show.